Right. So um, let's hit it off. The future of HR. That's a huge title. Uh, today we will um, focusing on uh, we will be focusing on engagement, engagement at work, because really it's it's the, the, the key uh, to everything to to set off um, the power of uh, employees and the power of humans really to go from human resources. I like to call it that to um, towards resourceful humans. So um, let's see. Okay, for today, I wanted to take you on a small journey, really. Um, and instead of making a PowerPoint for that, I decided to make a mural. Now, I'm going to, for now, I'm just going to share my mural with you um, through my screen. So you should be able to see it now. Am I right? Yes. All right. Thank you. So um, I'm going to zoom out a little bit just to give you an idea what we're um, going to do tonight. Might be a bit daunting, you know, maybe it's a bit too much. We'll see how far we get. Um, but um, as you can see, there's a line going from the left to the right. This is my, my timeline. And um, I'd like to first dig into a vision a little bit. So what is our vision? Uh, of an engaged workplace. Uh, and I would like to hear from all of you. I, we, we thought it would be a great check-in um, in breakout rooms to just discuss a little bit of what is it that you think a great engaged workplace would look and feel like. So that's the one that is all the way on the right because that's where we're heading, right? So this journey, um, we want to take it all the way there. But before that, um, in order to do that, we might have to take a look at the past and of course our current conditions. So where are we now? What are the numbers? What is the research telling us? You know, So that's also somewhere uh, in the middle. Um, so we will inv investigate that a bit more. And then I would love to come to um, an image or a list uh, of some actionable stuff, not from me, but from you, uh, all of you based on what we uh, have seen, what we have discussed throughout this uh, next hour and a bit maybe, right? So the first uh, exercise is basically the check-in. Um, so Simon, maybe you can share the link to the check-in window um, and explain a bit how we would like to do the breakouts. Yeah, for sure. So um, we're going to be getting into uh, breakout rooms with about five people. And um, I uh, recommend that you, uh, I'm going to paste a link into uh, the chat window. And um, one of the things around um, the way that the Zoom works that we are, you know, that, that we're talking through is that when you go into breakout rooms, you lose the chat that mm. uh, from the main room. Um, and so what I recommend you doing is uh, this link, which I'm pasting into the chat window now, uh, I recommend you open that in a browser. Now, only one of you is going to need to actually um, use the mural link, because what we're going to ask you to do is in your breakout room with four or five people, for the first minute or so, we'd like you to reflect and just have a chat um, with the others around what does an engaged workplace look and feel like? And then pick a volunteer from your uh, group mm -hmm. and that volunteer will be the one to put up two or three post-it notes around um, what your, your team, if you like, has chosen. So what mm -hmm. we should end up with here is a bunch of post-it notes on this section of the mural from each one of your groups, a few from each, each of the group. Now, during this seven minutes, we're going to give you seven minutes, um, what we um, would like you to do is also have a look at what other people are putting down mm -hmm. so that you can sort of sense make at the same time. And then afterwards, we'll have a very brief sort of session, have a look at what is going on. So just to recap in high, high, uh, the most highest level, get a copy of the link now out of the chat window. I'm going to put you into breakout rooms, discuss this question about what does the workplace look like and stick a couple of post-its now uh, with a volunteer. And then we'll pull you back again in about seven uh, minutes or so um, to, um, to sort of have a debrief. Um, so hopefully uh, at least one person in your group will have understood that. <laughs> so um, oh, oh, is that good, um, Michaela? Would you like me to put people into breakout groups now? Yes, that would be good. And I'll set the timer for seven minutes, all right? Okay, fantastic. That's brilliant. Is everybody back? Yes. Yes, I, like. Zoom has now telling me everyone's back. 
Wow, look at what you've created together, this dream. Let's have a look at it. Um, just scan a little bit, not just your own post-its, but mostly the other ones. Um, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot of things that you wish you had said yourself, or maybe they're quite the same thing, or maybe um, there's a link. So try to see some patterns, try to see uh, something that you know catches your eyes um, and tell us about it. Michaela, is there an opportunity to, to share the screen? It's just that through my oh, firewall, yeah. the slice has been blocked. Thank you. Thanks for asking. Yeah. So uh, which dream do we have? Somebody who would like to, uh, to say something. Maybe I can give it a start. Uh, what I see quite... Uh, frequently used is safety, psychological safety, trust. Yep. yep. This seems to be something like a common. Absolutely. So there's, there's a key element there that we all feel that is lacking uh, too often at the workplace. You're right. So uh, I see there's a few boundaries also. Um, you can make a big soup of it. Uh, I think this dream um, doesn't need to have boundaries, really. Of course, there were different groups. Um, any of the groups or any of the scribes maybe that would like to, you know, synthesize a little bit on the, the main topic that was discussed? We were thinking um, in group A that people are happy and they, they love to share mm -hmm. and they're not afraid to share. Yeah, yeah. So again, the safety feeling. And the, mm -hmm. yeah. I think in my group, we were also, and I can see it in other groups as well, that people feel valued and that the work that they're creating, they understand that it, it is making a real difference and contributing to the to the benefit of the business. Yeah, indeed. Uh, yeah, I can I see noticed, that. Notice yeah, trust, sure. trust is there. When I look at my own, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm engaged in the role that I have, you know, I'm trusted to just get on with my job. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I'm allowed to experiment. I'm allowed to fail. Um, and, yes. Uh, you know, that, that contributes towards working in an engaging environments. Yes. Somebody wrote, happy to challenge the status quo. Now, that's a good one. <laughs> no. No, that was from our group. and But it came off a theme of um, transparency, equal treatment, this idea of when you feel valued, then you speak clearly. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And well, then, the, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. I'm reading uh, the other uh, nobody's there, and I don't, I cannot find one single sticky that makes reference to something that will be external motivation. So everything that is there has to do with internal motivation. Yes, that's a good observation. So it all has to do with something that is within ourselves, um, not something objectively measurable almost, right? You're, that's true. That's true. So... So um, I think that will take us to, to the next thing, actually, um, because, OK, let's have this dream. This is what we want to work towards. Um, let's keep it in the back of our heads and, and let's see what the current state of affairs is, you know, when it comes to engagement at the workplace. So um, anyone who's in, in, the, in the mural can click on the outline. The outline is on the right, the top right. You see this uh, bulleted list there. You can click on number two. So I'll do the same. And then we end up here, right? So, um, of course, there's been a lot of research over the years, uh, one time, two times, you know, every few years. And um, there's a lot of research data that we can really work with, you know. Um, and when it comes to engagement, of course, there's the Gallup study, who is very, very well known. Um, and, uh, well, so I'll take the blurb of the, of the meetup set this um, that there's only 15% of us uh, really engaged at work, right? Whereas 18% is actively disengaged. So you can see the spreading um, on, on the world map, really. So that would be the global numbers. So um, some countries do better than others. But basically, we can just, you know, we have to realize that these numbers are really, really bad and quite sad as well. So, of course, um, Gallup based. It bases itself on a list of 12 questions. Now, it's interesting to go through these questions. Um, we're not going to do them one by one, but hey, have a look, scan them a little bit. Yeah. 
And there might be something that catches your eye and say, okay, this is what this is why I wrote this post-it on my dream, you know. Um, this links up to my post-it. So feel free to to take one out and, and speak about it. Maybe the post-it needs to go. <laughs> Right. So which one did we discuss earlier on that really um, is related to one of the questions here? Maybe I'll start. So the number seven, the at work, my opinions seem to count. This is what I heard before. Right. So to be trusted with the work that you do, that it's good work, you know, to um, to be entrusted with responsibilities. Right. So that points to that one. Anything else that you see? We um, we had a conversation in our group about um, the importance of community and a, a kind of yeah. a community feel uh, in, a, in an engaged workplace. And maybe number 10 speaks to that to some Absolutely. extent. Yes, have a, having a best friend at work indeed. So yeah, so all these things tap into, you know, earlier research as well. So what is it really that, that engages us at work or in life in general, you know, what makes us happy as human beings? So this list is quite well... Um, um, configured, you know. So this is what they use to get to these numbers on top. All right, so now what does this mean for us, right? Um, let's go a little bit to the right. There's another study, Global Study of Engagement. It's really an interesting thing, uh, the ADPRI. They did it in 2015 and, and once again in 2018. Now I underlined the little sentence here. So one of the reasons that engagement remains relatively low across the world is that organizations do not understand or act on the vital power of teams. So teamwork seems to be a clue here, right? Um, there's been a lot of research on teamwork. Think of the Aristotle project by Google. Think of, you know, there's so many things that, that revolve around teams. So now the same study states more or less the same numbers. They say merely 16% of people are fully engaged at work, which basically means that 84% of all the others are just coming to work, right? Okay, what to do about this and how to create the dream that we all have. Now, it's not that business leaders do not know where the keys are, you know? So a little bit down, you see what do business leaders worry about? And then you actually see that they they kind of feel that there's something with engagement. So they worry a lot about engagement, 85%, together with uh, company culture, together with the state of leadership, and most of all about organizational design. And of course, about how agile are we as an organization and how quickly can we respond to uh, market changes? So it seems that most leaders do know what needs to change, right? Um, but I think we could say that they don't really have a clue how to go about it. So regarding engagement, I made a small Menti. So you could go to menti.com. Um, I'll click oh, on this. Right, menti.com. And then there's a code that you can enter there. You can also see it on my screen. And maybe Simon will put it in the chat. Okay, well do. Just to do a small poll, you know, what is your ingredient for happiness at work? So five people already entered their answers, going up. And I'll just read a few out loud, of course. Appreciation, purpose, lots of purpose here. Kindness, absolutely. Safety and trust, yeah, mentioned before. few awesomes, <laughs> small groups of trusted mm. colleagues working together on something that we care about. Yes, absolutely. Making a difference. Bringing your whole self to work. Psychological Same. safety, yes. Opportunities to learn and grow, ideally, constantly. Yes. How many of us actually really get to bring our whole self to work? Yeah. It's just, it doesn't really happen, does it? 
could do a meetup on that one as well. <laughs> what does that mean, really? Yeah, yeah indeed. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Okay. So this is giving us some good, you know, food for thought. Um, this is basically what you uh, at in your daily work see as your ingredient for happiness. Either you're doing it already and this makes you really happy at work or you feel this is lacking and this makes you feel not engaged at work, right? So these ingredients we, we can really take along in our bag, you know, on this small journey that we want to make towards the vision. So I'm gonna to go to the next question. Thank you for sharing all your ideas. Um, and here I would like to do a short poll. So how engaged are we at work? So if you would do like a little bit of a Gallup assessment uh, just among all of us here, um, I just made a few questions and you can score them. So there's a, there's a slider that you can move for every question. So feel free to do that and then uh, we'll see. There will be an average shown on the screen. Can you see the next question? Yes. Okay, good. It's just come up on the same screen. So hopefully... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it just takes a bit. Well, okay. It just takes a bit of time over. to fill in because there's quite a few. Um, yeah, yeah the, and then, True. <laughs> yeah, the number is going up. It's lovely to see these sliders move. <laughs> yeah, I do like these things that do these in real time. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, of course, these questions are related to the same topics that we have uh, come across in the Gallup and. Uh, as well as in the dream, right? Okay. So I'm gonna make a screenshot of this one, just for now. Maybe not everybody answered, but more or less. Um, okay. So back to this one. Um, for now, I'll stick it here. This will give us some more ideas later on when it comes to concrete actions, because that's what we want to do at the end. All right, so could it be that some of the root causes of disengagement are in our management history? So that's something that I would like to investigate together with you. So we, over the years, of course, we, we have created some organizational habits, right? So there must be some stuff that still impact, impacts us today and today's happiness at work. So let's have a look a little bit further uh, into our past. And I wanted to focus on the 20th century. 20th century um, has been an amazing time. You know, lots of new inventions, people having their own mind, uh, individual, individualism as well. So um, all these ideas have had a huge impact on the world of work, right? One of them, of course, uh, and a very important one is Taylorism, or you could call it scientific management, which is the other name. Taylor was, um, in fact, he was a management consultant, a bit like Simon and me. <laughs> um, but in those days, well, he, um, he, he saw things very clearly. He, uh, he focused um, on more efficiency, on optimizing and improving processes, which basically sounds like a lean consultant. Uh, so nothing wrong with that, you would say. Um, but he uses the scientific methods to analyze uh, the most efficient production process in order to increase productivity. Now, that sounds very good, especially when you are a manager, when, when you have a factory, when you have, you know, um, a lot of pressures from the market. And uh, so he really played in that market. Um, now, what he also did was he... he he made a point of devising labor. So the division of labor is an idea that came from him. Um, and he meticulously studied processes and cut them up into very simple, small steps. 
and he decided that it would be best now after of course measuring a lot of stuff he decided it would be best that these micro steps would be uh, given to different people right so this is um, one of the, the keys of Taylorism right he was really convinced that there was one best way to be to do things so he was really looking for that the best way to do things and set a standard you know and for many companies this really worked well some of them really uh, doubled or even quadrupled their productivity right so this this really helped productivity uh, numbers going up but of course um, there was also a lot of other things that came along. You see Frederick Taylor's thinkers versus doers, I write it there. So he was really convinced that managers were there to do the design, whereas the workers were there to bring the value, to make the product. So this division, not only division of labor, but also division of um, tasks when it comes to um, deciding and uh, creating value. And he focused on time and motion. Now, there's a few others that are in the same uh, in the same, at the same time, uh, invented a lot of things that we still use today. Um, just naming a few, so the Gantt chart, of course, is very well known. Um, of course, bureaucracy is something that was invented then and we still have around <laughs> these days. Uh, the organigram uh, is also one of these things that we still have throughout company. Yeah. Every company has one. Um, so, and the one that I put in red, I would like to um, dig into a little bit more. So Henry Ford, he really was convinced that Taylorism was the way to go. And he did um, a lot of work. He really, you know, um, he didn't just do it. You know, he was, uh, he, he, he was the best in, in, in the classroom, you know. So what he did uh, was that on December the 1st in 1913, he installs the first moving assembly line. Because based on Taylor's uh, theory, um, he had found out, and he was inspired by the meat industry, he had found out that this was the best way to do mass production of his automobiles. Now, amazingly, he did this. He went from 12 hours to 30 minutes. I think it was a bit more. Um, yes. So that's an amazing, amazing progress when it comes to productivity. Right? So for him, this was a big hit. Now, Henry Ford, of course, still is a big hit. Uh, it's a company that still thrives and that we still all know. But of course, this assembly line, what did it do to the rest of the company? I mean, okay, the productivity boomed, so that was amazing. But what else did it impact? I would love to hear from you and maybe in the breakout groups would be great to do that. Um, if you go down here, um, you see that I put a few pictures up. So. He was inspired by the meat industry. And of course, the meat, you know, passed by like a sort of an assembly line. And he did the same thing with his cars. Now, my question to you all is, what is the impact of this invention? Let's assume some different perspectives and explore a little bit. Now, I put the uh, different perspectives on the board. So the workers, the product, the organization, and the boss. And I would love you to have a chat in the breakout rooms and maybe four of you can take uh, a perspective each. And then the fifth person will be the facilitator and the scribe. So um, Simon, how much time do they get for this one? All right, everybody back. Okay, yeah, we're all good. Welcome all right, back. so how about this exercise? I mean, it looks amazing <laughs> just looking at it without reading the posters, but I would love to hear some of your ideas on this exercise, right? So before going into these four topics, um, how was this an interesting exercise for you? Um, any insights that came up uh, comparing these four topics? I think I that, say, sorry. Yes. I was going to go first then, Fran. So. <laughs> um, I, actually, I was thinking everything was going to be negative, but actually there were a few positive things. That surprised me a little bit. Ah, yes. All right. Of course. I mean, there's something to say for all sides. Uh, and that's what perspectives are, right? <laughs> um, so, yes, I guess in those days, as most products were not complex. They were mo mainly either complicated or quite obvious. 
Um, and maybe for them it all made sense, you know, at least a little bit. Um, so could you name one of these things that really, you know, caught your eye? I think it was about, uh, I think in the product where quality, Mm -hmm. So quality might be better because you're doing the same thing over and over again. Yeah. That's yeah. Yeah. So basically that's what Taylor and Ford probably were after, right? So to build a really qualitative product and make the customers and the shareholders mainly uh, very happy. Um, so indeed, if you look at it from the product perspective, this was a good, a good uh, thing to do. Right. What about the others? So, think, so the comment, um, the comment I was going to make um, was actually more of a reflection that we found it a lot easier to brainstorm the impact on the workers than the mm -hmm. other three areas. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. I'm not sure we. I don't think we were, we were um, unique in that. But it looks like some of the groups actually found quite a lot of other ideas. But it was mm -hmm. much easier to brainstorm in the workers persona than think about the others. Yeah, interesting. Of course, we are all workers, so we can really. Uh, feel what it is like to be a worker. It's sometimes it's, it's more difficult to, to look at it from a systemic view, the organization, or maybe take the position of a boss. Um, so I can understand that. Did the other groups have the same feeling? Yeah. So I think that, um, you know, it, obviously uh, where the uh, highest amount of benefit happened was towards the product. Yeah. And obviously the economics behind that. Uh, but we can see how uh, in the other quadrants, uh, these functions started to emerge. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, uh, you know, at some point or another, it starts actually affecting the economy of, that, of the organization itself. Because for example, the people are overworked, they're stressed, they start getting injured from repetitive movement and so on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, the, the economics is, is probably very good short term. In the long run, of course, given the mentality at that time, they would just yes. replace the worker. But you know that 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 doesn't mean that the problem is there. Right? They're just yeah. working around. Yeah, uh, it's just a way to enforce command and control. Yeah, yeah. So basically, um, the four elements are equally important, right? Um, I mean, we all want to make a qualitative product. Of course, the workers, um, you say there's negative or dis dysfunctions popping up. Um, this, this means that there should be a balance, right? Um, all four perspectives are really important, but how to create a balance, right? How to make sure the boss is happy, the workers are happy, the product is fine enough, <laughs> good enough at least, um, to sell and, and that the organization is at a balance, you know? Um, so, of course, these management theories can have a lot of impact and Taylorism definitely had a lot of impact on the world or the world of, of work in those days and still today. And of course, now we only discuss the assembly line, which is basically when you use it for cars, um, is to create a complicated yeah. product. Now we could extrapolate that and, and try to figure this out again uh, once more, if we would focus on the knowledge industry and if you would get into more comp complex products, you know, um, anything that you would think of that would change this whole uh, this whole balance. So what to do with this? Um, this assembly line, for instance, if you would use it for a complex product, would there some would 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 that change something in our balance here? Mm. Would there be more dysfunctions at the worker's side? Do you mean with the same management theory? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry, I've, I don't really understand the question. So, you... Yeah, sorry, again. So my question here is, so imagine this assembly line, right? For cars, which is a complicated product. Um, this is the exercise we did. But what about a, a more complex product? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you would use the same management theory, so Taylorism, and you would use that to create a complex product like a software or, uh, you know, anything, uh, mm, knowledge uh, work, yeah, yeah. would that change the balance in our four perspectives? 
I definitely think so, all of you mm -hmm. here, him, because uh, I think um, you need the collaboration between the workers. You need yeah. all the truth and knowledge from the different people, and you cannot not um, think in boxes. You think together, work together, collaborate, and think. Mm -hmm. Need the creativity of all the people um, to find a solution for complex products. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. So, so indeed. Yeah. Um, we need everybody. So it would definitely change things at the worker side, right? Yes. Um, we all need to work even more together uh, to bring a qualitative product, right? So um, these two sides are really in balance. They have to be in balance. Uh, and that's something that maybe we run against um, more and more these days. Things are getting more and more complicated, more complex, which creates um, dysfunctions in one of these quadrants or even, even more than one. Um, and that's what we feel at work. Um, um, it, yeah. it strikes me as um, one of the things that we said earlier was around this idea that the worker is the doer and mm -hmm. the boss was the thinker. Yeah. Uh, and in knowledge work, of course, that's, um, I wouldn't say it's inverted, but it's certainly that everybody is a thinker. Mm -hmm. um, and when you've got everybody being the thinker, Obviously, that's going to significantly change the dynamic of uh, if that if that was the foundation of his management theory, you know that that assumption is no longer true. Um, and then, from a product perspective, I was also thinking about variability. Mm -hmm. So the production line is designed to limit variability, yeah. uh, and that's how you get the good quality. Whereas the work that we produce in knowledge work is infinitely variable. There's almost no two things that are the same. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of variability from the product scope means that you can't also operate in a doing space in the same way, as yeah. well as we're operating in, a, in the being space because we're all thinkers and we all need mm -hmm. to collaborate. So it yeah. fundamentally changes both the being and the doing. Indeed, you're right. That's a good observation. And if you would, for instance, say a, a, a product like software, building software, which is really a complex thing to do, um, and we still see that a lot of, a lot, well, not, well, some still um, organize work in silos, you know, first the analysis has to be then, or architecture even before that, and then we have to go to building the stuff, then the testing, and if you keep them all separately, it's like an assembly line, really, right? So in the end, we still do it, we still have our assembly lines, you know, it's, uh, it's something that we still uh, see on the work floor these days. So there's bound to be some imbalance uh, for the workers indeed. So they're all impacted. So both leadership, uh, well, leadership definitely has a lot to do or a lot to say about the structure and the way we work in the silos and stuff like that, the structure of the organizations. And all that has a very big impact on the culture and how we feel on the floor and how we tend to behave, you know, because this all impacts each other. So uh, that's my my link to your playbook, <laughs> Simon, for the ones who have a uh, have uh, been in Simon's class. All right. So of course, um, in in the twentieth century, this was not the only thing that was happening. There was also a few people who tried to counterbalance all of this. So where's the human side? Um, there's, for instance, Elton Mayo. He uh, he did some research on what he calls the Hawthorne effect. Um, highlighting the importance of relationships among people. So instead of just doing this assembly line thing or doing the thinkers versus doers, he was more into, okay, but it's really important to figure out what the impact is of social relationships on our work and of course on performance because that's what they were all investigating. Um, and of course, social relationships uh, can be really impactful. Um, and Douglas McGregor also did some uh, interesting research on that. You might know him. He's written this uh, interesting book, The Human Side of the Enterprise. Um, so he's an advocate for the human relations approach. And what he did, he investigated um, how our beliefs about working hard, you know, uh, about what motivates us really has a huge impact on the actual reality. So he investigated things about belief what is our belief? What is it that we believe engages us and motivates us at work? And there he says, look, um, he portrays two kinds of belief systems. You know, you could see them on a continuum, right? So this, they're a bit extreme. So there's the X theory and the Y theory. 
Um, and it says, okay, but if we are more heading towards the X theory, um, then we create an environment where force breeds counterforce. So this theory X belief, he says, it just generates controlling practices and people feel resistance because of that. And that's the social, the social um, relationship at work. Um, and then of course that leads to poor results. So it's like a cycle, we could call it a downward spiral. So on the other hand, the other extreme, the theory Y, he says um, it's much more about um, people wanting to be the best they can be contributes to creating value for others and things like that. Now, the funny thing is that if we think about ourselves, we're all convinced that we have this theory why. We all see ourselves as people who think or believe in theory why. But when we come at the work floor, there's always someone or even a few people that will say, okay, but they are theory X, you know? So when it comes to ourselves, we see this very positively. But when it comes to others, we tend to feel that some people are really theory X. So all this he really put together and he really maps it also on Maslow's hierarchy of, of needs. He says so both theories can you know, exist together, uh, but in the 20th century, it was definitely more the theory X, right? So the safety and the psychological uh, needs, more the physiological needs, whereas the theory Y focuses more on the top ones and the self-actualization. So all this, happens at the same time in the 20th century. They all influence each other, of course. Now, how would we reshape and transform the belief about work and engagement in our companies? This is a question we could ask ourselves. If this belief is so important and impacts the way that we see things, how could we change that belief? How can we, at our own companies today, try to transform that belief about what it is to be engaged at work. So that's a question we could ask ourselves. Now, the last one I would like to highlight very shortly is uh, Kurt Lewin. He was a German behavioral psychologist um, who emigrated to the, to the US before uh, World War II. And um, he had some research where he emphasized the importance of individual personalities, uh, interpersonal conflicts and situational variables. So he has this field theory in which he proposes that behavior is the result of the individual and the environment. So he puts a lot of weight on the environment. He says the B is for behavior, of course, um, is a function of personality and environment. Now, putting this in an equation like this means that if we change the environment, we can change behavior. Changing personalities, of course, is not so e easily done. So we could investigate people's personalities and try to figure out what they need, what their belief system is. You know, basic needs is always very good to know. But changing the environment is a bit easier. So we could focus on that, right? So that's another question. How can we create environments that impact behavior positively? Yeah. Two questions that we can ask ourselves. Well, what are things to focus on? What leads to more happiness? Let's try to figure that out. There's something called the human capital value chain, right? So you see the value chain from the left to the right, which basically very simply says, um, when we create the right environment where people can really be engaged and motivated at work, um, what we do is basically create happy customers. Happy customers, because in contact with these engaged people, with these engaged employees, they'll feel a really happy product, you know? They feel uh, they will come back to this company to buy more stuff, which brings, of course, more profit and will help our purpose forward. So it's actually, how do we set this chain in motion? That's the big question here. How can we make sure people are engaged, fully engaged at work? Right, because actually going back to that um, research that I discussed earlier, the ADPRI, it says that fully engaged at work means that it's the best predictor of improved work performance and productive behaviors. So they studied this and they say, look, it's really helping our productivity, people being engaged at work. So we need to create these prerequisites, right? 
for motivation, for engagement at work. So how do we do that? And in the research, they say a worker who is, is 12 times, mind you, 12 times, that's amazing, 12 times more likely to be fully engaged if he or she trusts the team leader. It's something that they found out. So there's something to do with trust, a word that already popped up in our dream. And there's something to do with team leaders and teams, right? Now, what really points to trusting a team leader is that people in a team clearly understand what is expected of them and that they have the chance to use their strengths every day. So these pointers, these two pointers, um, are showing that people are trust, trusting in their team leader. So this is what they found out. Something else very important to know uh, in the research is that workers who say they are on a team are 2.3 times more likely to be fully engaged. Okay, it's not 12 times, but 2.3 is also fairly uh, quite, quite something. Um, and actually, I put a little quote from a, from a book here. You might know it. Um, it's called The Nine Lies About Work from Marcus Buckingham and Ashley Goodall. Um, it says, across the world, the data reveals that it's extremely difficult to engage workers who do not feel part of a team. So this teamwork is super important. So um, to not set up to know very much about their teams, Current human resource systems are extensions of final systems. So at, at this day in companies, right? Sorry, that was a bit confusing. Current human resource systems are extensions of financial systems and are so able to show only who reports to whom boxes on an organizational chart. Think back of the organogram, right? Um, so the organizational chart doesn't really show what is happening in teams. We have no clue, right? So being as, as an HR uh, business partner or an HR director, this is something that we really have not in focus, right? We don't know what is happening in these teams. And the challenge with this, of course, is that most work does not happen in these boxes. So we have to make sure that we get a view, get it visualized um, and work with these teams, right? And with the effects that they have on our workforce and the engagement that they feel. Um, now, very recently, I reread Sapiens. Maybe you know that book as well. Um, it was really interesting to read. He has a small chapter on um, what it is, what makes humans happy. So us as, a, as the homo sapiens race, what, what makes us happy? Um, and he says, look, it's, it's mostly subjective well-being, is it? That's the way we try to figure it out, right? So subjective well-being, it's something that we feel inside, right? Whether it's a short pleasure or it's a long-term contentment. And um, the question is, of course, how can we measure it from the outside? That's not easy to do. So what we try to do is we try to bring it into correlation, these subjective findings, with what we know to be objective factors, like money, like health, like family, like community. These are things that we already discussed before. Community has an impact, definitely. Having a good family, having you know people who support you, having a good marriage apparently also has a very positive impact on engagement and happiness. But also money and health to a certain extent can make us quite happy for some time. And on the other hand, there is some subjective expectations because we don't really need research to know that, but basically to be engaged also has a lot to do with what you expect from it. So what I expect from work and what I expect from my work environment really impacts my engagement. That's not really difficult to know. Um, now there's a small um, quote here that I would also like to read together, right? the most important finding of all, and that's from the book from uh, Harari, is that happiness does not really depend on objective conditions of either wealth, health, or even community. Rather, it depends on the correlation between objective conditions and subjective expectations, right? So 
what is there for us to do? If we want to create an engaged workplace, we need to think about a few things here. We need to think about belief system. We need to think about building the right environment. We have to bring in more teams and try to figure out what makes them so engaging. And we have to make sure that there is trust in team leadership, right? These are the keys that we are getting here. And the last one, and not least, I would say, is how can we try to make people expect the right thing? And the small post is underneath says branding, media, advertisement. I think there's a lot there. People should expect something realistic, something that they can actually get at work. You know, it's no good to brand your company as a super environment when, when they, as soon as they enter, they feel it's the opposite, right? So there's something to do with expectations and how can we bring those expectations to a realistic level that makes sure that they still attract people, right? So all these different elements, um, I think it's interesting if we would combine them and see what we can do with them. Is there anyone who has a question or maybe a remark or an idea with all of these aspects? I do have a question, Michaela. Um, how would you, to create that engagement, how would you relate it to empowering of teams as well? Engagement versus empowerment, not versus, but how would you relate those? Because nowadays we hear a lot about that as well, to empower teams. Mm -hmm. And I see that to get them more engaged as well. Mm -hmm. And also the other way around, to get more engagement, you could empower teams. So how would you... How do you, would you see that? Yeah, well, teams in itself and empower them. Uh, I don't like the word empowerment so much. It's not my favorite uh, because it kind of um, brings up a power uh, element that I don't really like. But of course, we speak of team leadership. So you'd say, okay, there's one person who is you know, um, supporting the team in such a way that the team can really work and, and bring value. Um, so what you want to do is really give them the right amount of responsibility and that they can be autonomous on, on their own. Um, so yeah, there's definitely something to say about that. Um, teams need to be able to um, work together as an entity, but also have enough information to work together for the whole, you know what I mean? Because of course, sub-optimizing with teams on their own doesn't really help your company forward. So there needs to be a line of sight, a purpose to work towards um, that creates a certain um, sense of where we are all heading, you know? And I think if you have that, then you can really empower your teams to use that word that you used. Um, so it's, it's about giving them enough information to really work together with all the rest of them and make sure that they have a product that they can really produced by themselves and have enough support to do that. I'm not sure that answers your question, but it's a bit of a... <laughs> thank you, thank you. And I, I, I really appreciate your comment on the word empowerment. Totally, yeah. thank you. Right. <laughs> Anyone yeah, else would like to... Uh... The, 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 the empowered or powerful. Um, it certainly feels when someone's empowered, it feels that I'm giving you permission to be powerful, but I can take it away again. When someone is powerful, they have power. And mm -hmm. uh, I often think that this empowerment or having power comes from safety. Um, often we're asked to come into organizations because the, especially product ownership groups is a classic group who um, need empowering because they're not stepping up and taking mm -hmm. the entrepreneurial decisions they need to make within their product owner group. However, when you actually get into it, every time somebody from the product owner group tries to make a decision, <laughs> they get slapped back down again because, mm -hmm. um, the, uh, because they don't actually have they, uh, the ability to make entrepreneurial decisions because they, they're not in charge of the budget or they're not in charge of the real outcome or they're not in contact with the customers or they don't have the right uh, level of authority to make those decisions. And, and if they do, they get told off or there's, there's some other kind of non-safety there. And mm -hmm. uh, I think that, you know, that, that, that the empowerment or powerfulness comes hand in hand with safety. And mm -hmm. often that safety comes within having the right team structures. 
because having the right team structures means that it's very obvious and visible what your roles and responsibilities are. And, um, and, and going back to the point here where we were saying about the production line, so much of our organizations are split up that you don't get this kind of real team which means that there's no safety and then there's no stepping up and then there's no powerfulness. And it's all related to this. It's all such a, it's all these factors are so related. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I feel like I've gone off on a bit of a thing there, but anyway, it's just very Thank passionate. It's, it's, <laughs> it's amazing. And you, you just solved a big uh, problem that I'm trying to, that I've been appointed to solve in my company, which is like how to create empowered teams. And this is just the answer. So thank you. So could you summarize the answer for us, Anna? <laughs> for me, it's like, I'm going to challenge if that's what we truly want. Because mm -hmm. I don't think that, uh, so for me, it's just like a, a huge insight. Like the way I, I, when I listen to you both is like, okay, there is this fear actually that is attached to it. Like we need to have teams that are in power. And my question is, is that what we truly want? I don't think it is. Mm -hmm. Careful yeah. what you ask for. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. So yeah. I, you, I just feel that you pulled me out of the of the water. So thank you. Great. All right. I think if I can add a quick note, uh, if possible. Uh, one thing I uh, involved with the innovation team at our company, and one of the thing I, I tell them is we are born to innovate, and then we learn not to. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we are creative, and then we are asked to color between the line. Uh, so the in the sense of empower is. Uh, is the organization responsibility to remove the negative? What part of the organizational design, the team expectation that is not letting you be self-powered? Uh, and it's about not giving the positive, but it's about removing the negative that's stolen you down. Mm -hmm. so we, are, we are all naturally systems thinkers and uh, education and work actually shuts that down. Uh, there are some dedicated major efforts towards that end. But anyway, I wonder if it would be better to use the term enablement instead of empowerment. Mm -hmm. if it will be, because that, that has to do with motivation as well, right? So um, I wonder if we should advocate towards, you know, uh, trying to avoid using the, the, the word empowerment and more the word enablement. Yeah, enablement's a, a strange word as well because um, you know you are you are enabled to come in and, and sing songs and dance around. Um, but why don't we do those things? We don't even think about doing those things in an organisational context because it would be out of place. And so, are we truly enabled if we don't think about the things that we could be doing? Mm -hmm. And so the organizational culture and the way that we turn up and the, the, the existing kind of um, behaviors limit in ways which we're not even aware of our ability to be enabled. And we have to be explicit about what we're enabling and not expect people to show up and do something they haven't done before. For example, a product ownership role where somebody is entrepreneurial, if they've been a project manager before, enabling them to have that entrepreneurship, they might not even know the things to do, if you see what I mean. So enablement is another, I think that we have to be explicit about what we're expecting from people and enable through explicit culture mm. and explicit structures. Um, otherwise we end up with people just doing the same thing because they're not aware of the things that they could be doing. Yeah. There's a fine, a very fine balance there as well, um, because somebody wrote in the in the dream, I, I remember, wrote um, clear roles and responsibilities, which is. Oh, we've lost your sound, Michaela. We cannot hear you for some reason. Try, try again. OK, can you hear me? Yes, well, you're back. Well, hey. Um, Oh, we lost you again. <laughs> lost again. I tell you what, let me put everybody else on mute. No, we can't yeah. hear you, Michaela. Oh. What That's okay. What I'll do is let me just put everybody on mute. So I'm going to mute everybody. And then, so I'm the only one who can speak now. So Michaela, if you, you should, if you unmute yourself. There, can you hear me now? Well, I was saying, <laughs> There's a fine balance there because um, I remember in the dream, the, sh the shared dream that we started off with, somebody had written clear roles and responsibilities, which is of course something that you really want. Um, 
when you're talking about enabling, you know, uh, Simon was uh, referring to that, I think, right? Um, but to have two uh, strict roles and responsibilities is also not what you want. You want people to be able to, uh, maybe to use the metaphor again, draw outside the lines, you know? Um, there's something called boundary spanning, which means that um, you can do within your team and you know the role and the responsibility within your team. Um, but it's really good to have that line of sight and be able to, you know, cross that boundary and have a look around and make sure that you can also, you know, go out, go and help out others um, and make sure that you really use your abilities or your skills, because we saw that's one of the engagers um, to be able to use your skills at work. Um, so there's some, there's a fine balance there. I think you should, there should be some clarity, but not too much strict um, rules there. So I'm not so much a fan of job descriptions uh, like they're often uh, described these days. Uh, it should be more loose, more, you know, less detailed. It should be more free for people to explore. Uh, so that's something I would like to add here. Yeah. Is there um... that, that uh, to the point that they expect that they expect roles and responsibilities are actually going to limit them instead of, you know, allowing that, that um, you know, gradient to happen. And uh, that's rather sad. We don't come from that kind of environment. Also, you know, to, to what Simon was saying, um, you know, the, a contributor to that enablement is, I think, precisely the way we started the session today. And I, I really like it, you know, the, the, the very first exercise. Because, uh, you know, if we change the environment, then we change the behavior, right? This is a major contributor to that. So I think that together with that enablement, there has to be also that environmental uh, change. Um, Aspect, yeah. True. Thank okay. You. So I just playing yeah. my facilitator hat. It sounds like you're going to do the same thing. Just looking yeah, at the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, cool. Now, if you want to uh, carry on, then okay. I was just going to remind us of the time. That was all. It looks like you're already right. on it. So yeah, I summarized a little bit the things that we touched. You know, the belief, the environment, um, the expectations, the teamwork, the team leader, or the trust in the team leader. So these are different aspects that we could use in the next exercise. Um, so if you click on the last um, part in the outline, you, that will bring you to what can we do as from tomorrow to build a happier workplace? Now that's the key question, right? Because I would love it when you all um, uh, close your computers tonight with the feeling that tomorrow you can start experimenting, right? Um, so experimenting with beliefs, experimenting with environments. Um, I also put uh, maybe to give you some uh, extra ideas in the next exercise. Some, eight, some trends for highly progressive workplaces, which was um, uh, listed here by the corporate rebels. I'm a big fan of the corporate rebels. Um, so, well, what, some of them are, are there, of course, eh? the freedom and the trust, right? Um, of course, supportive leadership. We also discussed that shortly. Uh, the network of teams is there as well. And what you see here in the graph is what is the current situation and what is the desired situation. So they. They did the study um, asking teams and asking people, okay, what is it that you would actually desire and how do you um, score your situation today? And you see there's a lot of, there's a huge gap. So there's a lot of room for improvement there. Um, and I would love to hear some really concrete, actionable things from all of you based on the things that we touched tonight. So that's the next thing. Um, I think Simon will put the link in the chat that will bring yeah. you to that. So, um, this will be the bottom box. If you want to just highlight the box on your screen, um, okay, yes. as they can see, because the link doesn't actually take us to the right place. I've okay. just tested so this it. is the box. So, so this is going to be the last exercise because I can tell we're all getting a bit tired now. It's getting yep. late in the evening. Me too. So we're just going to do a very short exercise. And yeah. um, what we're looking for is to um, uh, come up with some actionable items about how, based on all the things that Michaela has taught us, the things that we've learned ourselves through the other exercises, can we come up with some actions, or if you're feeling really adventurous, an experiment um, on what could you actually do from an HR perspective to be able to improve the workplace based on the things we've talked about. So if you want to come up with a bunch of post-it notes, absolutely fine. If you can come up with an experiment as well, awesome. And we'll have a quick look at those, and then we'll wrap up for the evening. 
Um, so I'm going to put you into breakout rooms again, and um, we're actually going to have um, eight minutes um, because um, obviously we're getting uh, it's getting a bit tired, and eight minutes seems about a nice round number. So um, I'll put you into breakout rooms now. So just to um, if you look at where Michaela's screen is, that's the box where we're going to be using. It's in the bottom right hand corner of the mural, and uh, we're just going to be looking at what actionable things could we do from an HR perspective to make things better based on the stuff we've talked about. So I'll open the rooms up now and we'll see you all again in a eight minutes. All right, welcome back. I see some clusters on the board. I assume that's a bit of the, the different groups that we had. Um, yeah, great. Um, take, your, take some time to go through it with all the cards. I will also send you the, or, or I think Simon will send you the PDF of the mural. Um, so you can always go through them, but it's really interesting to have a look at these actionable things, you know, because that was the question, which actions, whether micro or macro actions, can you take from tomorrow to set the engagement chain in motion, right? Um, so um, Simon had said, look, if you have uh, the guts to do it, you can uh, formulate them in an experiment. Is there anyone who did that, who tried to um, give a definition of hypothesis and uh, an experiment worthwhile doing. If it that, was probably that, a bit of a tool order in the time, to be honest. <laughs> I, mean, I think so too. Eight minutes is not a lot for, uh, for uh, defining an experiment. Um, yeah. Well, any one of these actions would be interesting to hear, I guess. Is there somebody who would say, look, this one, the one that we thought of, is really worth telling because the others will definitely benefit from it too. We would love to but hear why don't we? Why don't we have one or two people say a few things and then probably um, we'll wrap up for the evening. I yes, think it'd be, it. uh, so it'd one be or nice two. to hear from, uh, uh, from one or two people. Yes. Uh, I can... Oh, sorry, go on. Sorry. No, no, you go for it. Oh, right. yeah. So one again. of the ideas I had of the thing I could try and I didn't put it in the post-it note because it's quite long. So the exercise that we did where we had the four quadrants where we talked about the different viewpoints of the assembly line. Yes. I was thinking this could be a good exercise to do with like a management layer. So I'm working in a company now where the management layer still has a lot of kind of theory X micromanagement mm -hmm. behaviors. And I thought one thing I could do is do that exercise with them and yeah. then do the same exercise with them where they are looking at the different viewpoints on the knowledge worker kind of software mm -hmm. development way of working in order to highlight from the managers and the organization's point of view how different it is to manage yeah, yeah. and from their perspective how much harder it is to really look at exactly what everybody's doing um, mm -hmm. and to kind of bring out bring out that conversation that they're moving from a safe place to an unsafe place from mm -hmm. the management perspective yeah. um, when people are working in teams because it's 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 quite a shift isn't it to be able to know exactly what everybody's doing to be able to kind of like walk up and down a line with a clipboard and go, yep, you're doing good, you're doing good, you're doing good, check, 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 to suddenly everyone's facing each other in a team, having their conversations. And as a manager, you're a bit like, oh, what's going on? Like, what are you doing? Is he performing? Is she doing good? Like, yeah. yeah you're right. And mm -hmm. then to try to, yeah, you use that as a way for them to go, right, this is, this feels weird. What can we do differently to, to help you be a manager in that situation? Yeah, that's a great feedback and a great idea as well, Jesse. Um, I think um, what we need to do indeed is just bring this narrative um, um, on the table, you know, and these different perspectives can really help people to see it from a different angle. And, and, and yeah, it's, it's basically what we're doing is here, putting on different hats and try to envision yourself within that, that um, perspective. Yeah. So that's a really good one. Yes. And it could set things in motion because you, um, you help people to really uh, put on different shoes, <laughs> sort of speaking. Yeah, great. Thank you. Anyone else would like to share their idea? I think one way to kind of start to think about how we do this is Agile for HR and HR for Agile. Uh, and this one was kind of like uh, uh, HR for Agile. And the way I put mine is more Agile for HR. And uh, part of what I talked about in my group is uh, HR really needs some business model innovation to mm -hmm. rethink the way we do things. Uh, and the way the what I'm experimenting in, and I have my uh, uh, agile coaches on the call with me here, so <laughs> they're going to test it. As uh -huh. we, we're right. trying to 
think about uh, potentially an HR hackathon uh, right. to reinvigorate the way we think about problems, the way we self-organize, um, and the way we produce solutions uh, as an experiment. Mm -hmm. uh, in the planning stages of that, we'll see how that turns out. Yeah, please write a blog about it and tell us. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> sounds very cool. Yeah, okay. Indeed, sounds like a good idea. A hackathon, and what's your envisioned outcome? What would you like to um, get from that? Uh, enable uh, innovation, uh, novice solutions to problems that we face, understand our customers, our problem statements, uh, and start to think about cross collaborations and breaking down silos uh, in a more uh, efficient way, rather than uh, this coming like top down, be more bottom up. Yeah. Uh, and and start to measure the impact of that on the business and the business outcomes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fantastic. Amazing. Would be great. Sounds All like right. you've just described the playbook. Brilliant. <laughs> 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 so uh, we probably need to. Um, uh, close for this evening yes um and um uh i hope that uh, so thank you michaela thank you for your insights <laughs> teaching and facilitation yeah thank you oh there's thank a you. lot more a lot more to discuss a lot more to see on the board well well we've lost your sound again i'm afraid I'm sure there's some amazing words of wisdom. Yeah, words of wisdom. Um, no, please say that again, because we just missed it. Oh, seriously. I said, oh, there's so much to discuss, more to look at on the board. And so we, we took this trip all the way from the vision back to the past. And then we're here again, you know, defining small, actionable things. So these micro and macro actions, what could they trigger? They could trigger happier workplaces. And they will create much more than just that, I think. Now, if you think about that, um, engaged workplaces could have much bigger impact than just your company. It would really create a different society in the end, right? Um, so keep that horizon in sight and just start experimenting, start talking to people, bring perspectives on the table um, and make sure to inspire to action like we are doing here. Um, try to make people think and reflect on what they can do to create better workplaces, right? And set this transformation in motion. So that was my call to action to all of you. Uh, so revisit the mural and try to bring some of your actions and ideas into, uh, into motion. That would be so awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Michaela. Thank you so much. I will create a PDF of this and put it on the website, um, uh, maybe on Meetup, so it's easy. It's, I won't email it out to all of you because I probably don't have half your email. So, um, I uh, would we'll just put it on there. And then my call to action would be, if you do know anyone who wants to, or perhaps yourself wants to come on the class with Michaela and myself, where we'll be going much deeper into di many different aspects of HR, um, then please do let them know um, so that we can get as many people and get the message out there as possible. Um, and the details of that are on the AWA website uh, for the, uh, the class. So uh, hopefully we'll see some of you there or some of your colleagues there. Uh, and in mm -hmm. the meantime, have fun and um, I wish you all the best on your journeys to making the world better. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you all. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Michaela. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thank everybody. You. Cheers. Thanks Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.